Hello everyone and welcome back. I hope you enjoy our last lecture covering cnidarians and tenophores. And then in this lecture, we're gonna cover uh, all the organisms in the phyla of platyhelminthes. And so I know in your textbook in chapters 14 and 15, it covers a variety of different uh, polyzoa and mesozoa. However, um, due to the fact that we only have 14 weeks in this class and I want to cover as much animal diversity as possible, we're really only going to cover a very small amount of uh, organisms that kind of fit in this uh, category. And so we're going to cover uh, platyhelminthes, which is in chapter 14 of your textbook, specifically 14.3. So before we dig into what platyhelminthes are and their anatomy and everything like that, let's step back and review um, protostomes. Okay, so just a reminder, protostomes are organisms whose blastopore, which is this opening here that results from gastrulation, becomes the mouth. So it's a quite large grouping of organisms. Within protostomia, we have two different clades. Um, they are also quite large groups, but the first uh, we're gonna talk about is Lophotrochozoa. And these organisms are protostomes, as I mentioned. They also undergo uh, mosaic cleavage, and they have one of two, or they might even have both, of these distinct characteristics. The first being uh, they may have a lophophore, which is a horseshoe shaped feeding structure. And this organism here is a good example of looking at what a lophophore is. So if you look at these tentacle uh, like structures here, they kind of go around this kind of base plate and it's in a U shape at the base. So that horseshoe shaped um, structure is the lophophore. Or they may have uh, a trochophore. So they can have a lophophore and a trochophore, but they have to have at least one of these two things. And a trochophore is a free swimming larvae form, uh, ciliated larvae. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. Uh, some of the organisms that are included in the uh, clade Lophotrochozoa are flatworms, mollusks, and annelids. So essentially this lecture, the next one, and the one after that will cover the Lophotrochozoans. And then our second large clade of protostomes are our ecdysozoans. And these are um, organisms that have a cuticle, they tend to molt, and some of them that are included are arthropods, nematodes, and tardigrades. And these are organisms that we'll talk about um, at the beginning of our next large chunk of the class. So after your next exam, we'll start talking about arthropods and things like that. So now that you know the two major clades of protostomes and protostomia, um, we're going to talk more about platyhelminthes specifically going forward. So platyhelminthes are a member of the clade Lophotrochozoa, and this is because they have a trochophore larvae. And a trochophore larvae is essentially just a top-shaped, uh, free-swimming, free-living larvae stage of the life cycle. And this image here is an actual trochophore larvae. And then of course, this is a cartoon image next to it. And they're characterized by this band of cilia around kind of some area of their, um, going around the circumfer circumference of the larvae. And this allows them to be free swimming and uh, living on their own separate from their parent. Some may also have a separate a uh, tuft of cilia elsewhere, but this is not present in all trochophore. And you can even see see them here in this image. This band here are those cilia on this trochophore. So that's essentially what it is. It's just a free swimming ciliated larval stage of the life cycle. So platyhelminthes are often called flatworms, and this is because they look like worms and they're flat. Um, so their name is pretty self-explanatory. They exhibit bilateral symmetry, so we can only divide this organism down one plane, so divide it with using one plane to get two mirrored halves. And they also have cephalization. So we had mentioned in our uh, lecture when we talked about symmetry that bilateral symmetry is often associated with the development of cephalization, and we start to see this in platyhelminthes. So in these uh, worms is when we actually start seeing a designated head with various sense organs and nervous system control um, located and centered in that region. So in these organisms, 
you can see more clearly with this image um, of this particular planarian. This is why I use this image, but you can see the head here. Um, you can also identify it using these two little dots here you can see are eye spots. So that kind of lets you know this is the head region. Not all planarians, uh, not all flatworms have these eye spots like this. I and mean, some of them it's not so easy to determine which end is the head. But um, in planarians, which is what this image is, they're a lot more easy to see. They are triploblastic, so platyhelminthes are the first organisms that we're seeing, that we're studying this semester, that have three germ layers, and they're acelomates. So that means that their coelom is completely filled with mesoderm tissue. And the tissue that fills the center is uh, called the parenchyme, and it's essentially just very cell-dense mesodermal tissue. And we'll take a look at some of that in the next slide. Platyhelminthes can be aquatic or terrestrial. They can also be free living, uh, have mutualistic relationships with other organisms, or parasitic. And a decent portion of the parasitic ones are major concerns to humans. There is a lot of debate as to whether platyhelminthes is a monophyletic clade um, due to the fact that there are no synapomorphies between all of the um, flatworms in the platyhelminthes clade. So um, that kind of begs the question, well, should they be considered to be monophyletic? Um, but we do see some molecular evidence that suggests that they are uh, related to one another and they, they all stem from a common ancestor. So there's a lot of questions as to if this clade is monophyletic or not. However, one thing that um, has been kind of determined is that the parasitic um, species of flatworms are in a monophyletic group. So the the parasitic species that we have are Trematoda, Monogenea, and Cestoda, and they're all uh, within a clade that's called Neodermata. And they're all characterized by this, uh, by this structure called the syncytial tegument, or Neodermis. And we'll talk a lot more about what that is in the structure in a minute. But they all have this same um, trait, the same characteristic about them, so they're concluded in a monophyletic grouping. The other um, classes that we have, well, other class of flatworms we have are the turbillaria, and the, this is where things kind of get a little wonky as to it should it be a monophyletic group or not. And some examples are planarians, which is what you see in this image here. Um, they're commonly used in experiments because they can regenerate and you can cut them in half and then they'll regenerate their lost and missing parts. Um, also in examples are flukes. If you guys, any of you guys are interested in the medical field or in um, parasitology, uh, flukes and tapeworms are going to be a lot of interest to you because they cause a lot of issues in um, humans, also in various uh, animals like your pets and livestock and things like that. There are some key differences in the morphology between the parasitic and non-parasitic classes of flatworms. So when we're looking at the epidermis of a non-parasitic flatworm, they have their uh, normal, kind of what we would think of as an epidermis, so a densely packed layer of cells that lie on the outside of the organism, you know, as a protection, things like that. And within their epidermis, they have lots of cilia. So they have these little hair-like projections that help them move uh, through the water column or on rocks, leaves, wherever they're living. Um, and then they also have mucus that coats the organism to help them uh, facilitate that movement on whatever surface that they're, they're living on. This is present, the ciliated epidermis is present in the non-parasitic forms. This is not present in the parasitic forms. In the parasitic flatworms, they have something called the syncytial tegument. And going back, just to kind of break down this word, syncytia, remember we talked about, is a single cell that has multi-nuclei. So it's a multi-nucleated cell. And then tegument just means body covering. So their body covering is a very large multi-nucleated cell. And you can see that in this image here. Um, this, these kind of invaginations here, this cell, is the tegument cell body. So it has a nucleus, it has various organelles, 
right? We can recognize this as a, as a cell. But the thing that's different about this cell is its cytoplasm extends up past the muscle fibers of the organism to the outer uh, layer of the organism. And we have this distal cytoplasm here. So that's a continuation of the cytoplasm of that cell. And the cytoplasm of this cell is connected with the cytoplasm of the cell next to it and a cell next to it and a cell next to it, right? So instead of them being separate cells, they're considered to be one large multinucleated cell because their cytoplasm is continuous. It doesn't, there is no cutoff between cells. So the syncytial tegument is just one very large cell cytoplasm that engulfs the entire organism and acts as their epidermis. The syncytial tegument helps with these parasitic uh, flatworms to allow them to resist the organism's immune system and then also to resist digestive enzymes. So this is one thing that makes them so difficult to get rid of once you have an infection with one of these parasites. It also helps them to absorb nutrients that they need from their host and also with secretion of waste. Um, the only ciliated form uh, of li in the life cycle of these uh, parasitic flatworms is in the larvae. So we talked about the trochophore larvae um, is ciliated. That's the only time that they're ciliated. And you can see further looking into the, the structure of the epidermis. In this case, in the syncytial tegument, we have our cell body begins below the muscle layer and extends to the outer side of the muscles. Whereas when we're looking at our non-parasitic um, flatworms, their epidermis and their uh, muscle layer are clearly defined and the epidermis lies outside or external to the, the first layer of muscles. So there are some uh, structural differences in their epidermis and how their muscles and epidermis layers are organized. They have, uh, flatworms have several different types of muscles. They're really good at moving around because they have a lot of different types of muscles. They have muscles that run circularly, so around the entire uh, circumference of the organism. And you can see that here as this band I'm not going to draw the whole thing, but that kind of smooth looking band. They also have muscles that run longitudinally. So down the from the head to the tail region or the you know anterior to posterior region, they have muscles that run that direction. And that's in this image, the speckly muscle layer here. Um, and then see longitudinal. And then they also have, and the circular muscles, and they also have their um, well, muscles that run diagonally through the organism, through the parenchyme. And you can see those here in this image that are drawn as these kind of column-like uh, muscles. And so all these muscles work together to allow the organism to move and, and catch its prey and things like that, to be an active predator and to escape from, from predators. Um, they also have a very parenchyme dense um, mesoderm well, yeah, mesodermal layer in the center. So we talked about them being acelomates and their coelom is completely filled with mesoderm and I call them parenchyma cells. That's all this uh, pink baloney like looking material in the middle is showing you the, the parenchyma. Flatworms like cnidarians have a blind gut. They don't have the same type of gut, but they're similar in the fact that there's only one opening. So there's only one way for food to come in and any undigested waste uh, must go out of that same opening. So the gastrovascular cavity in flat and flatworms is responsible for both digestion and circulation. So it has kind of dual functions. The, uh, for the single opening for the digestive system is the mouth and the mouth in flatworms, in this case we're looking at a planarian in this, uh, in this cartoon image here, is not where you would expect it to be. So we most of the time would think, oh, mouth should be in the anterior region. But in this case, in planarians, their mouth is actually on their ventral side. And it's kind of somewhere in the middle of their body plan along their anterior posterior axis. So in this image, you can see that their mouth is located here. And then um, the mouth leads to something called the pharyngeal chamber, which is this opening here. And within the pharyngeal chamber, you have your pharynx. 
And the pharynx is almost like the esophagus of the planarian. And they're able to extend the pharynx through the pharyngeal uh, chamber, out of the mouth, and into their prey. So you can see that here in this image, that's actually the pharynx um, from that flatworm um, going into their prey. And this is, the prey is this kind of meaty pink bit here. And this will allow them to um, get the nutrients uh, that they need from their prey to digest their prey and absorb um, all the nutrients they need. The, um, the pharynx then leads to the intestines. So the intestines of flatworms are heavily branched. You can see that branching here. This is why it looks so uh, kind of squealy. Each of these is a branch. And branching patterns differ between different species of flatworms. But essentially, the um, the intestines are composed of three different regions. Um, in this example from a planarian, we have three different regions. We have this one anterior uh, region and then two posterior regions, one here and one here. And so um, that's kind of how the whole digestive tract works. So you have their, your mouth, your pharyngeal chamber, your pharynx, and your uh, branched intestine. This is an example, this planarian is an example of a free living um, non-parasitic flatworm and they generally will eat small crustaceans, nematodes, rotifers, which are these small microscopic um, uh, plant, uh, not plants, animals, and then uh, insects as well. And how this process works, um, I'm going to try to explain it to you guys. It's kind of hard to uh, verbalize, but uh, if you want to see an actual flatworm hunting um, like footage of it, I've included a video at the very end of this presentation of a flatworm uh, hunting a snail, and you can see how this process works if my explanation is not so clear. So essentially, a uh, flatworm will use chemoreceptors in its uh, head region to track down its prey, so follow its scent. And once it finds its prey, it will use its anterior region to uh, kind of grab that prey and bring it in. And then it'll use its mucus as well to help with gripping the prey. And then it will kind of roll in onto the prey to push it down towards the mouth. Um, because it needs to get the prey near the mouth so that the pharynx can extend through the mouth and penetrate the prey. So once the prey is near the mouth, the pharynx will extend and penetrate the prey and the um, flatworm will then start to release enzymes through the pharynx that will break down the tissues of its prey and then basically making it like a nutritious soup. And then the flatworm will use its pharynx to uh, basically suck up the nutrients like a straw. And so that's kind of how this process works. If that wasn't so clear, I definitely recommend watching the video. It makes a lot more sense of how to kind of grab the prey and kind of roll it towards the mouth and kind of, and hold on to it so that it can digest it. The digestion of its prey occurs uh, extracellularly and intracellularly. So the extracellular digestion is uh, when the organism is pumping those enzymes into the prey to break it down. So that's extracellular digestion. And then after the food is brought in through the pharynx and is brought into the intestines, the cells that line the intestines will phagocytose the um, di partially digested food for further digestion, which is the intracellular part of the digestive uh, process. So that whole uh, explanation applies to the free living predatory uh, flatworms. It does not uh, apply to the parasitic, uh, the parasitic classes. So in our monogenians and trematoda, um, these are two of the three parasitic classes. They actually have an anterior mouth so their mouth is not uh, in their, on their ventral, kind of mid through their body. Um, it actually is present on the head. And they feed on the host cells, uh, cell debris, and your body fluids. So they don't need to actively capture prey. And then in the organisms in class Cestoda, they lack a, um, they lack a digestive system altogether. So they don't have any digestive organs. Um, they simply just 
absorb the nutrients from their host. So they rely on you to do all the hard work of breaking down the food and then they just absorb the nutrients um, that you worked hard to get. Flatworms are the first organisms we're talking about this semester that uh, exhibit organs and organ systems. And so we had talked about cnidarians that were a lot more simple. They did not have cephalization. They did not have three germ layers. They were just diploblastic. Um, and they didn't have designated organs. They just had kind of a nerve net and their uh, musculoepithelial cells. But now that we're into the flatworms, we're starting to see uh, cephalization, so the development of a head, triploblasty, um, and the development of actual organs and organ systems. So we're not going to talk super in depth about all of these organ systems and how they work, but they, it is important to know that we're starting to see more complex systems um, in the animal kingdom now that we're kind of into flatworms and then it'll get more and more complex as we keep going through this semester. So one organ system uh, that I think you should know is called the protonephridia, and it's shown here in this image. And this organ is responsible for osmoregulation. And so based on the name protonephridia, you can probably guess by the nephra part what this organ is for. Um, like nephrons in the kidneys, this is kind of like the kidneys of the organism. But instead of removal of nitrogenous waste, they just really regulate the water balance within the organisms. Nitrogenous waste is instead removed directly via the body wall. Um, these organisms are very, very flat, so the cells uh, can just diffuse out the nitrogenous waste uh, that they have. But this protonephridia is really important, especially in organisms that live in freshwater environments, to make sure that water doesn't just rush into their tissues and they explode, right? So is there, this protonephridia is composed of these osmoregulatory tubules, which is shown here as this kind of meshwork. And then they have their flame cells, which are these, um, they're showing in this image, these kind of circular nucleated cells in the end. And this image is just showing you a zoomed in version. And they're called flame cells because they have these flagella at the base of the body that uh, constantly move around and they're moving in a way that makes them look like flames, so flame cells. And they're responsible for just bringing in the um, potential waste fluids and sorting them out and removing excess waste and excess water. So um, they're starting to have um, kind of rudimentary kidneys, if you will. They're not real kidneys, but we're starting to see uh, organs that are responsible for removal of waste, osmoregulation, and things like that in the flatworms. Flatworms also have a rudimentary nervous system. So this nerve system is far more complex than the nerve net that we saw in cnidarians, but it's not too far distant from a nerve net. It's called the subepidermal uh, nerve plexus. And in flatworms, we can see more uh, complex nervous nerve development here. So we're actually starting to see the development of brains. Some of them have a bilobed brain. And in this image, you can see the two lobes of the brain here, um, labeled uh, by the cerebral ganglia. And then they also have, um, in this image, you can see this planarian has longitudinal nerves that run from the anterior to the posterior region of the organism. So all the blue here are showing you the nerves. And they also have these transverse nerves that run uh, the width of the organism as well. So they have this nice mesh of nervous tissue. And they, they, they also have specialized neurons. And these specialized neurons are really important to um, understanding the evolution of more complex nervous systems in higher order animals like uh, mammals and reptiles and things like that. So we're starting to see the development of true nervous systems in um, flatworms that will become more and more complex as we go along. And then we have mentioned very briefly that flatworms have uh, sense organs. We talked about these eye spots, which in this picture on this cartoon of Plarian are here. Eye spots, the technical name for them are oscilli. They can also have tactile and chemoreceptive cells that help them to um, 
catch prey and orient themselves in their environment. They also have a strategist. So we talked about strategist in um, our previous chapter on Nidarians. If you don't remember, go back to that. And they can have Rio receptors as well. So they are um, far more advanced in sensing their environment, which is very important because we're starting to see or organisms that are predators, active predators. So you need to be able to find prey, capture prey, um, escape predators, and interact with your environment. Flatworms can undergo either sexual or asexual reproduction. And when they undergo asexual reproduction, it's via fission. So the uh, parent organism will basically split down the middle and then the two offspring will regenerate their missing parts. Most are monoecious, uh, meaning that they have both the male and female organs contained within the same organism. However, they do require cross fertilization for uh, reproduction to occur. And this is common in snails and other hermaphroditic organisms as well, where they require um, cross fertilization to reproduce. They cannot undergo self fertilization, or self fertilization is rather rare or not preferred. Um, they have a, flatworms have a common genital pore for both the male and female reproductive organs. So you can see it here as the gonopore pore in this, or in this picture, and it's just this opening right here. So both the male and female organs empty out of the same uh, genital pore. The life cycles of um, flatworms can actually be rather complex, especially in the parasitic classes where they have more than one host um, and they have a lot of different uh, stages of their life cycle that they can undergo. And uh, we had mentioned before that for them to be considered lophotrochozoans, they, they consider that because they have a trochophore larvae. Um, they can also develop into um, just straight juveniles of the adults. So a trochophore larvae is not always seen. And this image here shows you this, this cute little thing is just basically a juvenile uh, planarian um, on a ruler. Now let's get into the actual classes of flatworms. Uh, we'll start with our only non-parasitic class, our turbolarians. And these are our free swimming, free living um, flatworms. And they can be marine, they can be terrestrial, they can live in fresh water as well. So they have a variety of habitats. And um, some of them can be actually quite beautiful. So um, a lot of the marine flatworms have lots of brilliant colors and things. Some of them can be plain, but still kind of cute. I thought this little guy was quite adorable. Um, and some like the, this is a planaria here. Um, can be rather plain, but still pretty interesting. And they can be distinguished based on their gut and their pharynx. So the structure of their gut, some of them have more branches in their gut um, than others. We had talked about planarians, how they had three branches, um, anterior and then two posterior kind of segments, and then each had the kind of bubbly branching on them. So you can look at that. You can also look at the structure of the pharynx to differentiate different um, species of uh, turbolarians. And then they have uh, muscles like we talked about in that in a couple slides ago, and they had their cilia for movement. So all of these are the only kind of class that have those cilia. After this, all the other classes we're going to talk about have the syncytial tegument. Next, we have our trematoda, and these are our, in, our parasitic flutes, and these are endoparasites of vertebrates, and they have many, many adaptations that allow them to be very effective parasites. So many of them have hooks and suckers that allow them to attach to their hosts and kind of anchor onto them. They also may have penetration glands that help them to uh, bury into the muscles and uh, various organs of the host as well as glands that allow for them to form cysts so they can live within the host muscles um, or tissues for extended periods of time, especially in like the uh, intermediate hosts. And they can re reproduce very rapidly. Um, we'll talk about the life cycles in a second, but essentially, um, especially in their intermediate host and even in their final host, they can reproduce rather quickly, which allows them to be as pervasive as they are in humans and various other vertebrates today. They have an anterior mouth, so this is different from what we were talking about in uh, planarians that had a mouth that was on their ventral side, kind of 
midway through their body their body uh, their body line between their anterior and posterior region and in this case they have their mouth on their anterior end so on their head and they're mostly monoecious but they do not undergo self-fertilization and their biggest subclass are the digenia and um, these are extremely important economically and medically so we're going to actually spend uh, the next slide or so talking specifically about this subclass of trematoda organisms in the subclass digenia are very similar to the vast majority of other flatworm parasites in that they have at least two hosts. They have an intermediate host, which is where they undergo asexual reproduction, and they have a final vertebrate host, which is where they undergo sexual reproduction. In the case of Digenia, at least one of their um, intermediate hosts is going to be a mollusk, um, generally a snail. They can have more than one intermediate host, but at least one of those is going to be a snail. Uh, or a mollusk, but generally snails. And then when they finally find their way into their vertebrate host, they can set up shop in a variety of areas. They can go to your digestive tract, respiratory tract, reproductive organs, um, your circulatory system, your urinary tract, uh, anywhere basically that they are able to set up shop, they can. Uh, various parasites will have, depending on the species, specific areas that they can target, but some are able to um, set up shop in various organs of your body. So um, they're kind of versatile in that way, unfortunate for us. So going through the life cycle of um, the organisms in the subclass Digenia, this is just a general example. We're not gonna go through every single flatworm parasite's life cycle, but I think this is a good example. So um, we start, we're gonna start this cycle with our vertebrate host, which is in this case, a four unfortunate guy. Um, they are well he will release the shelled embryos from his intestines into uh, some sort of water supply via feces so he'll defecate and then the shelled embryos will uh, find their way to water so this can be you know, rivers lakes um, watershed from from rainwater uh, streams various things like that right this is why I don't drink contaminated water uh, not sterile water but anyway so then the, uh, the embryo will hatch from its uh, shell and it will be uh, eaten by a snail, right? So this, this in some parasites is very time sensitive. So they need to find their intermediate host as fast as possible and get eaten um, or penetrate the skin of their intermediate host. In the case of uh, the organisms in subclass Digenia, they need to be eaten by a snail. Once eaten in the snail, they will uh, set up shop in their intermediate host and undergo asexual reproduction. So these embryos um, will form a sporocyst and then the sporocyst will reproduce asexually to form more sporocysts and um, another form called the radiae. And then the radiae will undergo asexual reproduction to form more radiae and to form uh, cercariae. And then those cercariae are the actual uh, form of the organism that then leaves the snail to find a uh, secondary host um, or a uh, primary host, or they can insist on vegetation. So depending on the species, some of these uh, cercariae will then find, like in this image, a secondary host, which is a sad little fish, and they will get into the muscles of the fish. And um, when that contaminated fish meat undercooked is eaten by a human, that's how they end up back in us. But not all of the species in this uh, subclass will um, will undergo the same process. Some will go directly to their final host and bury into their skin to get to their muscles or be ingested um, directly from, um, the, from contaminated water and things like that. Um, or they can insist on vegetation and be eaten by something else or just wait it out until they find um, the right intermediate host or final host. And then, um, once I met, as I mentioned, once they get into the vertebrate host, um, these cysts that formed in, let's say it's a secondary host, will um, be released and then they will travel to wherever organ in that vertebrate's body they want to set up shop.
So just a review, the, uh, the shelled embryos are, re are released from the vertebrate host via feces. Once they get into water, the embryos will re get removed from their shell and then they will get eaten by a snail. Within the snail, they'll undergo asexual reproduction to form, a, well, they'll, they'll turn to sporosis, then they undergo asexual reproduction to form uh, radiae and then cercariae. Sur the cercariae are, leave the snail and they can either find their primary um, final host, they can find another intermediate host, or they can um, uh, insist on vegetation. But eventually, once they make it to their final host, they will um, develop into juveniles, and then those juveniles will travel to whatever organ system or tissue that they want to live in in their final host. So this is actually a cool example, well, it's cool to look at, but it's sad for the snail, of how a parasite helps to facilitate its own passage to its final host. Um, so in this case, you see these snails have these cool little tentacles here that are like these cute little colors and they look so festive. Um, this actually sucks for the snail. This is not a something of the snail's anatomy. Their tentacles have actually been um, infected with the parasite and the parasite um, pulsates with these green and orange colors and causes the snail takes over the snail's brain basically and causes the snail to climb up to the tops of branches and stalks so that it'll be more noticed by birds. And then it'll pulsate the tentacles of the snail to look like a grub and make it more noticeable to passing by birds. And then the bird finally attracted to all this movement and this easy food will eat the snail. And in this case, these parasites, their last, um, their final host is actually a bird. Um, so I just use this as an example to show you that this process is not necessarily all haphazard. The parasite can also play a role in helping it move from intermediate host to final host. And there's actually a video um, at the end of this PowerPoint about these uh, zombie snails if you're more interested in that. Some examples of um, organisms in this subclass that are very important to humans are uh, Schistosoma mansoni, and that causes Schistosomiasis, something you might be familiar with, and um, Falcolia hepti heptica, sorry, these are hard for me too sometimes, and this causes liver rot in livestock. So um, you can start to see how impactful these can be, especially in Schistosomiasis, which is actually not super duper uncommon in humans. Another species within this subclass of importance to humans is Clonorchis sinensis, and these are the liver flukes, so they hang out in your liver. They have three hosts, two intermediate hosts, one being a snail, the other being a fish, and then a final vertebrate host, which is human beings. And you can get these through the consumption of raw fish, which really sucks if you're someone like me who loves poke and sashimi and sushi. Um, if you consume contaminated raw fish, you can potentially be exposed to Clonorchis sinensis as well as various other parasites. Parasites um, present in raw fish is not uncommon. It's actually so common that um, it's said that if you consume raw fish at least a couple of times in your lifetime, you've been exposed to some sort of parasite. So, but but don't freak out. Okay, that doesn't mean that you got the parasite that you're infected. It just means that you're potentially exposed. So exposed and infected are two separate things. But um, with as much, if you eat as much sushi and poke and things like that as I do, then you've definitely been at least exposed. So I don't advise eating raw meat. Uh, do as I say, not as I do. Right. So, but anyway. So uh, Clonorchis sinensis sets up shop in the bile ducts of your liver and they can cause severe abdominal pain, cirrhosis, and even death. So this is more than just some simple food poisoning. This can be potentially life-threatening if you get the, an infection of this parasite. And then we also have our schistosomas. So we mentioned very briefly uh, schistosoma uh, mansoni in the last um, slide, but there are actually other uh, species of schistosoma that can also give you severe illnesses. And schistosoma are the blood flukes, so they hang out in your circulatory system, uh, eating away at you and, and your nutrients. Um, depending on which species of schistosoma you get infected with can um, make your disease more or less severe. 
Um, they can take up shop in the large intestine, the small intestine, and, or near the bladder. So the veins that line your large intestine, small intestine, bladder, etc. They just hang out there. They are unique in the um, flatworm family in that they're dioecious, not monoecious, and their male and female um, organisms have an interesting interaction with one another. So the males are actually a little bit shorter and thicker, and they have this line, this canal that runs along the length of their body. And the females are longer and thinner. And the females will uh, hang out and live in that canal. So in this image here, you can see the male is this larger one, and then the female is this thinner, longer one. And she will live in the, the body canal of the male. It's schistosomas cause uh, schistosomiasis, and they can cause severe tissue damage due to their eggs. So the eggs can become lodged into in your kidneys and, and, and various organs and cause severe damage. It can cause ulcers, abscesses. Um, they can lead to bloody urine and bloody stool, pain, um, also rashes. So you don't really want to get cystosomiasis. No one wants to ever get a parasite, um, but you definitely want to, don't want to get this. And it's actually relatively common. Um, people get them commonly, um, especially in the case of a rash, from uh, untreated contaminated water areas. So always be wary of um, being in contaminated water, but it's more than just consumption. Some parasites can actually dig through your skin. So just being in contaminated water can potentially put you at risk. The next class of flatworms we have is the monogenia, and they're unique in the fact that they only have a single host. So we talked about how most flatworms have at least two hosts, an intermediate and a final vertebrate host. In this case, they just have the one. They cause little damage to their hosts under normal circumstances, unless if a whole bunch of hosts, uh, potential hosts, are uh, grouped in a highly populated area. So like fish farms and things like that, where potential hosts are in close proximity to one another, then they can cause problems. But most of the time, they try to cause little damage um, to their host. They can have a variety of different types of hosts. Fish, frogs, turtles, and even hippos are susceptible. And they look something like this. And they have a, a unique structure called a, a pistopter here on their posterior end. And they use that for attachment to their host. So this is the anterior end, and this is actually the posterior end for attachment. And it's got little hooks on there that help it anchor into the tissues. And in this picture, you can actually see one um, kind of hanging out in the gills of a fish, just hanging out in there, surviving. So um, the things to just remember really about this uh, class are that they have a single host and they have this epistopter that they use for um, anchoring to their host tissues. The last class of flatworms is cestoda, and cestoda are our tapeworms. And they're characterized by this kind of long, flat bodies with a scolex and proglottids, but they don't have a head. So what looks like their head is actually not their head. The scolex, which is often mistaken for a head, is actually at the posterior end of the organism and allows them to anchor to the tissues. So this image here shows you an example. The scolex can have um, hooks, they can have suckers, or they can have both. So whatever um, they need, depending on the species, in order to properly anchor into the intestines of their host. And then from the scolex, they have these uh, proglottids. And the proglottids are the chain of segments that um, go from the scolex and kind of out from that region. And each chain, uh, each segment of this chain actually has its own set of reproductive organs. So the proglottids in this image you can see are like this little one here, this one here. Each of these squares is a proglottid. And they have different regions. So they have the immature proglottids because they all kind of start from at the region between the, scol the scolex and the uh, immature proglottids. There's a region where they're produced. 
So they're the most immature ones are there. That means the reproductive organs are not yet ready um, and they're not yet mature. And then they become mature proglottids and then they become the gravid proglottids. And the gravid proglottids are the ones that end up um, able to break off and um, leave via the feces so that they can go and infect someone else. So the question that a lot of um, taxonomists ask themselves is, is this true segmentation? So we can see that it looks like tapeworms are segmented. So are we starting to see segmentation? And the answer for many people is yes, but the answer also for others is no. So in your textbook, they um, side on the side of no, that that tapeworms don't exhibit true segmentation um, or metamerism, which is another fancy term for segmentation. Um, they coin it as pseudo-metamerism, but uh, basically just know that there is some questions out there as to whether this is true segmentation or not, because some uh, you see some repeti repetition, but um, some argue that that repetition in each segment is not actually segmentation, it's just something that's segmentation-like. They lack a digestive system, so um, we mentioned in the very, very beginning that tapeworms basically uh, rely on your digestive tract to break down all the food to, and then they basically absorb the uh, nutrients from your intestines. Um, so they're making you do all the hard work and then stealing your food. And they use microvilli on their, um, on their body to increase their surface area so they can maximize as much nutrient absorption as possible. They are hermaphroditic, so they're monoecious, um, and they can actually undergo self-fertilization. They prefer cross-fertilization, but when necessary, um, or when this is the like, you know, only option, things like that, they can undergo self-fertilization where they will use their own proglottids to fertilize their own other proglottids. <laughs> they, uh, tapeworms generally have two hosts. They take up shop in their final host um, digestive tract. So in the vertebrates, they hang out in your gut. And that makes sense because they have no um, digestive system on their own. They need your digestive system to break it down. If they lived anywhere else, they would, they would starve. And the infections are very, very common of tapeworms, um, especially in the past, but they're still common today. But they do little harm to, your, to the host. So you may have a tapeworm and not even know it. Um, and some people in, uh, consciously infect themselves with tapeworms as a method of weight loss. I do not recommend that, do not do it. Um, but I know some people um, out there do seek tapeworms and actively infect themselves to lose weight um, and other things like that. So yeah, and how you get tapeworms is through the consumption of raw or undercooked meat. Um, but you can also get tapeworms through contact with animals uh, like dogs, cats, foxes, etc., who are contaminated, um, who have contracted it themselves. So the big thing, the big thing here, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, is uh, avoid eating raw or undercooked meat. It'll probably give you some sort of parasite if you do it enough. Looking more closely at the anatomy and life cycle of Cestoda, we're gonna take a look at Tainia signata. And this is a beef tapeworm. So you can get these through consumption of contaminated beef that's been undercooked. And the juveniles basically hang out in the intramuscular tissue of cows. And so if you're eating an undercooked uh, burger or steak or something like that, you can potentially be exposed to um, this parasite. Once the parasite, uh, this tapeworm, is in the final host, it can grow up to 10 meters in length and be composed of over 2,000 proglottids. So remember we talked about each proglottid is its own separate reproductive structures. So each of those can go on to infect someone. So if someone who's infected with a very mature um, tapeworm can uh, potentially release 2,000, even over 2,000 um, proglottids in their feces and infect other cows and people and things like that. So looking at the life cycle of uh, Tainia signata or just you know tapeworms as in general, um, we're going to start with the, the cow. So a unsuspecting cow eats some contaminated grass and um, when it eats this grass that the uh, shelled larvae are actually attached 
to the vegetation. So they don't know. They just eating grass. And then once the um, the shelled larvae enter into the host, their intermediate host, the cow, they will then uh, release from their shell and travel to the intramuscular tissue and hang out there. And they will develop into juveniles within that intramuscular tissue. So they'll develop their scolex um, and they'll start to mature into um, baby tapeworms. So then um, the poor cow goes to slaughter and gets cooked at a, a local barbecue by some barbecue novice. And um, they unfortunately undercook the beef. And so you as a un unsuspecting guest of this barbecue, then go and eat this undercooked steak or whatever. And um, that those tapeworm juveniles that were in the tissues, the muscular tissue of the cow has now entered your body. Once the tapeworm gets to your intestine, it uh, uses its scolex to attach to your intestinal wall and then starts to develop proglottids and mature and it'll just hang out in there um, until it dies essentially or it gets removed. So as the uh, tapeworm is maturing, it's producing more and more proglottids. Uh, those proglottids will mature and then they will become gravided proglottids and they can then leave via the feces um, if they're um, fertilized and um, have, contain a larvae. So each of the, let's say these segments, let's say this segment and this segment and this segment down here have all been fertilized um, via self-fertilization or cross-fertilization and um, they all have now a larvae and those proglottids will break off and go into the feces of the human who maybe is in a field or somewhere and um, they excrete their feces on the grass which is then eaten by a cow and then the cycle continues right so that's how the life cycle of the beef tapeworm goes. The uh, life cycle of the pork tapeworm is very similar, um, but they can be really vicious um, if you accidentally consume them when they haven't gone through an intermediate host. So the intermediate host for the pork tapeworm is pork, is pigs. But if you accidentally um, consume the tapeworms through contaminated food that's been contaminated with human feces, those um, the, the parasite can tra actually travel to your brain and your spinal cord and your liver and even the muscles of your eyes and potentially put your life at risk. So um, it goes from bad to, to worse. And when, it gets in, when you get these types of infections, it can actually lead to death. So um, you wanna make sure that you're always washing your hands always to only trust people who wash their hands and uh, try not to eat raw or undercooked food. Alrighty, so we've gotten to the end of our talk on platyhelminthes. Um, you can go ahead and start reading chapter 14, really just reading the introduction and then the section 14.3, uh, which covers platyhelminthes, and then uh, the chapter 14 smart book assignment. And then um, I have a couple of videos here that might be helpful for you guys. There's the one I talked about with the flatworm eating a snail. It's quite interesting to look at. It's very short, it's two minutes. And then there's a planarian video that talks about some basics of planaria. Um, just to give you kind of a reminder, it gives you some basic key points. And then the uh, video of regarding the zombie snail. So excellent. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Um, hope it wasn't too gross, but I will see you in the next presentation where we talk about one of my favorite things in the whole world, mollusks.